Hello and welcome. So I want to start by saying that this may be a challenging Sunday social. We're going to explore various female characters in the Bible over the course of February. But for this first one, I'm going to take a bit more of an overview of women and gender in general. <clears throat> so please bear with me and come on this journey with me. So you may have realised from previous posts or if you've been to any of my in-person services back when we could do them, that I have something of a passion for inclusion. When we're faced with things that challenge us within the church as much as in wider society. Times when the things we thought were clear somehow aren't and the black and white suddenly has different shades in it. I was going to say shades of grey but that seems completely inappropriate in a church service. Oh dear, said it now. For some of you, <clears throat> huge changes have happened in your lifetime, like the legalising of homosexuality in 1967. Huge changes in language that is acceptable, and now even relatively young people like me are trying to get our heads around the idea of um, gender, gender identity. The world changes faster than we can keep up sometimes, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Our God is eternal and eternally relevant. So we need to learn to communicate that, that relevance, even when things change around us. My main aim is to encourage you to think about how we understand the Bible. There are lots of people whose gender or sexuality doesn't fit what for a long time has been considered normal that have felt hurt by the reaction of the Christian community to who they consider themselves to truly be. And this has contributed to deep pain and even suicide. I want to work with you to share information and understanding so that as a church we can avoid causing more harm and hurt. Our interpretations of the Bible may differ, but let's agree that we are called to love others. I'm sharing with you some thoughts in this service that are mine. I represent the Methodist Church, but these words are mine. To respond to someone's heartfelt inner struggle to accept themselves in the face of rejection with judgment or condemnation is going to lead to even more hurt. And I don't think that that response comes from God. I'm not going to go into huge levels of detail about Bible commentary and or even try and persuade you of one view over another. But I firmly believe that we need to show love to all and not in some backhanded way of saying love the sinner but not the sin. I mean love people where they are and accept them as they authentically believe themselves to be. It's not for us to judge or get in between God and individuals. As we look at some female characters from the Bible, we're going to do Hagar, Sarah and the Canaanite woman. We'll look at cultural and theological themes, but today I'm thinking more about gender. I'm going to be referring to the creation stories in Genesis and using that as my Bible basis for the talky bit later. We're going to hear from Ella, a trans woman who very generously and bravely agreed to have a chat with me about her experiences. If you watch the interview carefully, you will see that I use the wrong word. I say dysmorphia when I should say dysphoria. And all I can say is I'm learning at the same time as everyone else. And then we're going to also hear from Auden, who uses they, them pronouns. We'll discover what that means. Auden has also helped me to do a short clip that talks about terminology. But before all that, and keeping with the theme of Genesis, here is a sketch by the lovely Tony and Helen. Uh, what's it all about, I ask you? What are you whining on about now, Adam? One moment we're in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, and the next we're stuck out here and all places covered in weeds. And all because of one stupid bit of fruit. Oh, don't bring that up again. I've said I'm sorry. The old blooming garden of fresh produce, and you have to pick the one piece of forbidden vegetable matter. Why don't you give me some passion fruit? I like passion fruit. 
it wasn't my fault. Oh, yes, and that's another thing. Why do you listen to a snake? A snake, I ask you. You never listen to me. He was very persuasive. A snake? How can a snake be persuasive? Well, he was... He's told us. He was so charming. And he told us that if we ate some fruit, some forbidden fruit from that particular tree, that we would gain wisdom. And you believed him? He seemed so wide-eyed and innocent. Well, of course he's wide-eyed. He's a snake. He hasn't got any eyelids. And when I get older, he won't have any legs either. Oh, violence isn't the answer. You tell that to the lion. He's had three sheep already today. I don't know what's happened. The whole place has gone to wreck and ruin. It's not my fault. Well, it certainly isn't mine. I was perfectly happy, pottering around, doing a bit of pruning, naming the animals. Well, that's just it. That's just the point. You were never there. And you expected me to get the supper on the table. If you did a bit more of the work round here, then none of this would have happened. Don't you go shifting the blame onto me. I've been working flat out trying to find a name for that black and white horse. You'll have to use another letter. There's only one left. Everything's running down and wearing out. I know. This is the third set of fig leaves that I've had to collect this week. I keep smagging, snagging mine on brambles and things. Doesn't that hurt? Mm, my eyes have been watering all day. I'm sick and tired of it all. Everything used to be so perfect, but now it's all in shreds. Quite literally, I see. Oh, pick me another leaf, will you? Do it yourself. I'm not your servant. You're so moody these days. You leave my moods out of it. I don't know what's got into you. Men. What do you mean, men? There's only one of me. Man, then. Ooh, you know what I really want? I wish we could start all over again. Well, we can't. We have to pay the price for being disobedient. We? Oh, I know you're going to blame me for that forever, but but there's nothing we can do about it. No, oh, it's God I blame. He's the one who gave us free will and intelligence, and he's the one who made us, gave us the ability to mess up. So he's the one who should sort it all out and make it all right again. And how is he going to do that? I don't know, but he should. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Well, there's no point whinging on. Oh, I'm ravenous. How about roast another unicorn? No, no. We finished the last of those last Friday. There's some apple pie left. No. I fancy something roasted. I wonder what that black and white horse tastes like. So for the first bit of, um, of our service, I just want to clarify some terminology. And Auden is going to help me with this. Um, we're going to talk to Auden a bit more later. But just first to get us thinking in terms of the right words for things. I'm going to throw some words at Auden, who's going to um, share with us um, their interpretation. So transgender. Um, yeah, so transgender basically uh, means it's an umbrella term. Um, it means uh, a person who doesn't identify with the gender that they were assigned at, at birth. Um, so uh, it it will include uh, trans men, trans women, uh, non-binary uh, people and, and basically uh, everyone in between, but not every body who doesn't uh, identify with their gender that they were assigned at birth would identify with the trans label so it's just important to be aware that that a person isn't necessarily going to call themselves trans okay and so um how about cisgender um so cis Gender uh, basically means that a person identifies with the gender that they were assigned at birth. And um, it's a Latin uh, term that means um, on, on the same side of, basically. So you're on the same side as of the gender that you were assigned at birth, as it were. And then um, another a, a phrase, which would be gender dysphoria. Um, so this is... Uh, it's actually a medical diagnosis. Um, it's a, a mental health uh, condition um, where a person 
experiences um, distress um, obviously to different uh, degrees and and this impacts on their life um, because of the fact that they don't um, they don't identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth and and their experience of being kind of pushed into a particular box is extremely uh, difficult and uncomfortable um, and again it's important to note that not all trans people experience uh, gender dysphoria um, and um, wouldn't you know seek a diagnosis um, and may not even be diagnosed as having gender dysphoria um, and um, it it is a problematic term as well for uh, trans people because it, it it pathologizes our lived experience um, it makes it a thing uh, rather than um, part of you know kind of growing up when you realize who you are mm-hmm. um, and what labels you want to associate with you know we don't we don't have a um, like a goth dysphoria or you know I can't think of but you know it's just yeah it's part of your journey of of kind of self-realization okay and then um the term non-binary uh so this basically means that um a person doesn't fit into uh the categories of uh male or female I've, I've drawn a little diagram to help you understand i don't know if you can oh see. yes so yeah if we think of gender as a, a spectrum sorry this is the the gender spectrum so you know at one end we have male it's probably the wrong way around but that's like the kind of archetypal stereotype man he's got lots of hair and then the archetypal stereotypical woman you know with makeup etc now most people are not at one end or the other um in and in fact actually um studies have shown that uh people who identify you know at, at the extremes actually uh have more uh mental health issues most people are kind of somewhere you know mm. around on the spectrum uh but they may be sufficiently close to one end or the other that they're happy with that mm box and I I personally I'm non-binary I'd say I'm kind of around about here Mm -hmm. but it can move you know depending on how I feel and what I'm doing yeah um so it yeah it just means that it's a it's a more kind of fluid place on on the gender spectrum If I ran away, your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Cause your love never fails Stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love now.
For today's service, I am joined by Ella, who is um, in the United States, and she's going to talk to us about her own experiences. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to maybe deal with some things that, that, that we may not understand, some common misconceptions, but mostly I think it's just really, really valuable for us to hear your story. So Ella, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so um, my name is Ella. I am a transgender woman. Um, I use she and her pronouns. Um, so I guess I will start by saying that um, unlike a lot of other trans people I've spoken to, I didn't really know for sure as a young child that I felt as though I was in the wrong body. Um, I definitely felt compelled towards things that were at least um, considered by my culture to be more feminine but you know what being teased and kind of picked on as a young person I kind of taught and conditioned myself to try to avoid those things because they were considered you know girly and not right um, and then you know there were definitely questions as to whether or not I, I was gay growing up at, into my adolescence because um, I was definitely definitely more into like dance and theater and things that were you know, typically considered um, more geared towards female. But at the same time, I just had such uh, a great appreciation for, you know, things like fashion and dance. And um, it, it just, I felt more comfortable being around girls. I felt more comfortable talking with girls. Boys were just intimidating to me. I didn't feel like I fit in. Um, a lot of them assumed that that I was gay, that I was a sissy, that, you know, I was just a freak. I was definitely an awkward kid. That didn't help. Um, that always kind of made me feel insecure in many different ways. But um, I never really felt, you know, for sure that I was in the wrong body or that I really experienced dysphoria because growing up, the education hadn't really caught up. So we didn't really understand that we had, we knew about drag queens and transvestites. And I do remember in health class, there was a lesson on uh, transsexuals, but it was very brief. It was just kind of a quick little mention. And we also covered um, hermaphrodites and intersex people. So I kind of associated the two together. Um, so it never really dawned on me. I never gave it much thought. Um, I, was not raised with any religion whatsoever, but when I was uh, 16 years old, I was invited to the, the Baptist church in town and I did attend. Again, I was very unhappy, just, you know, very hurt kid. I didn't have um, a strong, you know, family life at home. I didn't have a lot of stability and it was just a struggle. And, you know, experiencing God's love for the first time was just so transformative to me. 
I never really thought about, I knew about their, the fact that there were homophobic churches, that people did try to use the Bible to condemn gay people. And I obviously didn't agree with that. Being a young, I felt pretty progressive. It never really, I never thought about it. However, you know, being in certain settings and certain environments and sitting under the same teaching, I did slowly over time develop kind of the belief system that, you know, maybe homosexuality is a sin and maybe, you know, cross-dressing is, is immoral and inappropriate. These were just, you know, slowly over time, that kind of progressive nature I had kind of eroded. And I kind of just assuming that, you know, that the church and at least the denomination and even some of the media that I was listening to, that they must be the ones that have the Bible interpreted right. They, their studies must be accurate. Not really taking the time to even look at other sources and other opinions because that just assumption was there. This is where this is where I was saved. The, these people know the gospel better than other denominations. They're more true to um, traditional biblical teachings. But did I ever actually investigate and see that to be, could you even prove that that's accurate? That's kind of a hard claim to make mm -hmm. in general. So, um, you know, over time, I kind of built up that belief system. Um, but anyway, uh, jumping ahead a bit, um, ended up getting married in the church. I uh, had two beautiful twin babies, um, two girls, Grace and Lily. They're awesome. Um, they're 11 now. <laughs> so some time has passed. Um, unfortunately I did end up getting divorced, but I'm not really looking to discuss that out of respect for <laughs> others involved. Um, and I will say that coming back to the church after divorce was a little awkward, a little uncomfortable in some sense. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, no one was rude or disrespectful or insulting. In fact, quite the contrary, they were really, um, really kind and warm and, um, generous. And it was a very, you know, very sweet time, but, you know, I had, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, I had gone to seminary a few years before my divorce. I had, you know, aspirations of, you know, becoming a preacher and, and doing full-time ministry eventually. Um, shortly after that graduation, you know, it was really kind of hard getting my foot in the door anywhere. So I was already experiencing um, some obstacles in that sense. And then, you know, going through a divorce kind of just made it a whole lot more difficult. And I decided after a, a couple of years after my divorce, I felt like God had really, you know, brought me through some healing and prepared me and taught me a lot. And I kind of wanted to pick up where I left off and try to get back into ministry. And unfortunately, I just, for whatever reason, I, I could not get back into really anything um, concrete. I just kept hitting roadblock after roadblock. And that was frustrating. Um, in my early uh, or I'd say, yeah, when my kids were still really young and when I was still married, um, a very close friend of mine who actually grew up in the same church actually came out to me as a trans woman. Um, I that completely threw me for a loop and I had no idea that she in any way identified in any way different. Um, I also still was really not familiar with with um, the terminology and really what it meant to be transgender mm -hmm. and that kind of in a kind of hope to understand it a little bit more um I did a lot of research and as I explored it slowly I, I kind of started to realize that you know a lot of these um I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what I want to say, but like a lot, a lot of these characteristics were yeah. present in me I just had never really considered it so like not wanting to make any assumptions, I kind of just allowed myself to explore it a little bit more. Mm. Um, and I, I, you know, the more I explored, the more I saw that, that that truly was a much more comfortable, more fitting, more authentic way for me to um, conduct and see myself. Mm. And that was really kind of scary at the time because that kind of just rocked my world of everything I thought I was supposed to be. Um, also at the same time, still being married, I kind of like, it was not the time to explore that. So unfortunately, um, instead of just kind of trying to make peace with myself and kind of just trying to work through it and, um, I guess I say a more responsible way and maybe, you know, seek some kind of counseling. I just decided to 
completely repress it like it was um, some drug that I had to quit and just completely like um, refuse myself to like, I would not um, allow myself to embrace yeah. or even like explore anything feminine at all. Um, I really did feel as though it were, it was like a sin. It was a sinful nature mm-hmm. that I, I needed to repress and I needed to repent of. So um, I went in the opposite direction and I tried to present myself as super or I guess at least stereotypically super masculine. I grew out the biggest beard you can imagine. Um, I started dressing in camo, everything. I know I've never hunted before, but I had camo all over my car, all over, like, I just, just everything in camo. Um, I even like went like to great efforts to make my voice sound deeper because like, I really felt like I need to like run a hundred miles an hour in the opposite direction. And that just, you know, brought more and more self-loathing and insecurity Mm -hmm. and not being comfortable with myself. And just, it it was a disaster. And it Mm -hmm. was just um, truly, you know, just self-destructive the way I loathed myself. Um, Mm -hmm. So I ended up just becoming like more depressed. I gained a lot of weight um, and just, yeah, it was really, really sad. So you know, going through my divorce and just slowly God was working on my heart and bringing me to a place of better health, bringing me to a place of kind of respecting myself a little bit more, wanting something from my life other than just, you know, at that time it was, I loved my kids and that our relationship was basically what I lived for. And I would go and get my kids and have a wonderful three and a half days and then I'd bring them back to their mom's house and I'd go to work and just be miserable until it was time to pick them up again yeah. but I got to a point where I really wanted to actually um I guess enjoy my life and, mm. and really just kind of you know have more than just okay this is my time with my kids and then I yeah. go to work yeah so um you know I I started working out and I started I quit drinking I um kind of just tried to count my blessings a little more each day and just try to be a little more thankful, try to be more active in my faith. Um, In early 2020, I ended up getting engaged, uh, which didn't last. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Uh, You know, I I don't want to just say because of COVID, there were multiple reasons. Most most importantly, we weren't meant to be together. So I don't need to discuss that much. But that propelled me into, you know, just kind of, like even more of a sense of trying to figure out who I truly was and once I like allowed those barriers to come down to actually explore um who I truly was and just starting to really like appreciate and want that more and more um so like for me 2020 was a bit of a different experience because you know it was really the year that I truly discovered who I was and made peace with it um and all the fears I had about, you know, coming out just slowly crumbled. Like my work was amazing. They were from the get go. They were like incredible. They, yeah. you know, took great care of me. They promised my, my job security. They changed yeah. my name in the system immediately. They just did everything yeah. they could to make it, you know, a comfortable. So, you know, my yeah. job was that was the first place where I could really be Ella. And it was awesome. And I like started loving coming to work. And there were people yes, that I worked them- with. I'm right in thinking in America, I think it's probably the same in this country, um, transgender is not something that's protected characteristic. So um, you couldn't, in this country, I'm sure, we're still not in a situation where people are properly protected from discrimination because of their gender, their gender identity. Yeah, and it varies from state to state. But yeah, on the federal level, I know that there were a lot of um, Obama um, era policies that Trump did away with um he you know he banned transgender people from serving in the military I was not aware that that was still in place that makes me sick but thankfully a lot of that is going to be reversed back but yeah yeah so So I mean you talked about a sort of I think there's a subtle difference between church and faith because faith seems like a really positive theme but Uh it's 
it's church and, and maybe the teachings of church that could have been a less positive experience. So if you're talking to, to our church community here, what advice would you give them about being truly welcoming and affirming to people who may be having thoughts about the sort of experiences that you've had? What, what's the, the good advice and try not to do this, don't say that, you know? Yeah, um, so I would honestly just, I mean, I don't want to sound too hack cliche, but just loving people, just the same love and kindness and acceptance that you would give um, a man and woman married couple that were visiting for the first time. And, you know, if if you really feel in your heart that you're convicted, that you want to know more, you want to understand that person's experience more, then I would just um, encourage you to reach out to them in a polite way. And maybe that's not the case or you just reach out to them to go get coffee and whatever it may be. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sit down, you know, Q&A discussion, just really um, not having any barriers to, to loving them and to fellowshipping with them, I would say. Over here, there's, there's been a bit of um, discussion or, or reaction to the idea of education in school, including transgender and gender dysmorphia and I think there are people who think that if you teach children and you know young people about transgender somehow that will put the idea in their head how do you uh -huh. respond to that um so there there's uh I was watching a documentary with uh Stephen Fry he's on your side of the pond he, I yeah. love him he's awesome and uh, even though he's you know he's kind of against most organized religion I don't agree with everything he yeah. Says. yeah 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 <laughs> Um, you know, he he went over to, I think, Russia um, and there were countries that were considering the, the same ban on this education. And that was one of the arguments. And I've heard that before um, mm -hmm. a few years ago here in Massachusetts, this blue state, that question came up. They wanted to not only um, remove the education, but they also wanted to make certain policies for trans students when it came to sports and other school activities. Um, so that's definitely a big thing. The reason why, so like there really is no, there's no evidence to suggest that that education would actually encourage people. Um, there's actually studies that have shown that cis children are, and transgender people are, uh, transgender children rather, are just as comfortable and secure um, in their gender, ident gender identity at uh, younger ages. The reason this education is so important is it's to prevent homophobia and transphobia in our schools. Um, a lot of, you know, people, one of the, a lot of the arguments made against, you know, being openly gay or being openly transgender is that you're gonna have a rough life. They're gonna have discrimination. They're gonna get bullied. That's only because of transphobia and, and homophobia. But if we can, you know, teach children early that it's not a sickness, it's not a mental illness, it's not a perversion, then there's a good chance that they'll grow up without having those concepts and there won't be that bullying and that discrimination. It's never gonna change if we just, you know, yeah. push these concepts aside and never talk about them, then that, that bullying yeah. and that stuff's always gonna be there. But we have a chance to really get to people, especially at a young age. Yeah, thank you so much, Ella. This is so useful for all of them, all of the guys over here trying to get their heads around what I think is, um, it just seems like a different world. So thank you so much for having the courage to, to share your experience with us. Thank you. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty and Worth. Nothing in this world can satisfy Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry Your presence is heaven to me Yeah.
treasure of my heart and of my soul In my weakness you are merciful Redeemer of my past and present wrongs Holder of my future days to come Most people watching this will will know what a pronoun is, but they might not understand um, the way that, that we would use it in this context, or the, the sort of function um, and how it can be helpful. What, what's your understanding of, of pronouns in this context? Um, so obviously pronouns are a linguistic uh, shorthand for referring to people without having to say their name all the time. Um, and they are gendered um, and um, in our language in English um, we don't have gendered nouns as they do for example in uh, German or, or French but we do have gendered pronouns um, and so we use he for a person who we assume is male and she for a person who we assume is uh, female um, but if we don't know a person's gender, we have always used they. Um, an example would be uh, you find an um, umbrella in a cafe and you would say, oh, someone's left their umbrella behind because you don't know whose it is. So you're not going to assume it's a man or a woman. And nobody says, oh, somebody's left uh, he his or hers you know, umbrella behind. You don't say that. You say they. Uh, and so for non-binary people like myself, uh, that is an appropriate uh, pronoun because it accurately or more accurately um, expresses our gender than he or she. So I, I wouldn't want to be called he because I have never in my life identified as a man um and uh, I don't identify as a woman so I don't want to be called she mm. either yeah and that's probably quite helpful because we would I think all of us react against it but it's yeah. <laughs> share that it's it's they 
them, their, th those are the pronouns that are appropriate. Um, and, and that's really helpful. And um, so I've got one last term, which is transition. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there is a, some confusion about this term uh, that people think, first of all, that trans is short for transition, which it isn't. So I mentioned earlier that cis is a Latin term that means on the same side of. Uh, trans is also a Latin term that means on the other side of. Uh, so it basically means that a person is on the other side of the gender that they were assigned at birth. Uh, transition uh, popularly means that a person has undergone some kind of physical transformation uh, in their journey from the gender that they were assigned at birth to the gender that they actually identify as. Uh, and this often involves, uh, you know, in people's minds, like quite extreme medical uh, intervention, for example, uh, castration or um, having breasts removed or implanted. Um, but this is quite problematic because, first of all, it reinforces the idea that men and women have to look a particular way, uh, which is hurtful for everybody because um, a person can be you know a cis woman but not have enormous breasts mm. and they're still just as much of a woman um, and we see that don't we with um, the reaction that the, the pain that a lot of women go through when they have to have um, breast removed for cancer treatment and such like there's a lot of trauma isn't there because of this sense that as a woman your breasts define you yeah exactly and and this idea that you know particular um shapes of body you know are attached to particular genders it it harms everyone it's it's the same with you know ideas that like men can't have emotions that hurts everyone uh, so it's exactly the same kind of concept you know as a woman your body is whatever it is um, so there is absolutely no obligation on any trans person to change their body. Um, and so a more uh, embracing use of the term transition, um, to my mind, would be uh, describing the journey that a person has gone through where they've gone from kind of living essentially a closeted existence where their gender identity is inside themselves to being open about it. And, and that is a journey uh, and it is a journey of transition from being hidden mm -hmm. to being open. And it often starts off, you know, confiding in people close to you, you know, trying out different names, trying out different pronouns to eventually, you know, kind of being out in, in the world. So, uh, transition more accurately describes that journey um, which may for uh, somebody involve you know medical uh, you know processes hormone treatments etc but it's not essential yeah. to it and a person who hasn't undergone any medical intervention is no less trans than somebody who has that's really useful. So that, that's our little session on terminology. And now we're going to move on with the rest of the service and Auden will be back shortly. OK, um, so I'm going to start again now. Right. So we've already met Auden earlier in the service, but now we're going to um, talk to them more. And I'm going to start by introducing them. I'm struggling with pronouns here, I'm sorry. Um, so Auden is a friend of one of our church members here in Newquay and has very bravely and kindly agreed to talk to us and to share their experiences. Auden is a lecturer in law at Nottingham Law School, hence I take it some of the understanding of Latin terminology. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going to just talk uh, a bit generally um, perhaps you could start by telling us a bit about your own experiences. You touched on this a little bit before, but what, what has been your journey? Um, so uh, I was assigned female at birth um, and um, 
just to explain that a little bit um, kind of more generally, um, if we think about it, it's a little bit of an odd uh, process uh, that happens. You know, a baby uh, is born and then a doctor takes a cursory look at their genitals and decides to put them in a particular gender box that then shapes that literally the rest of their lives it, it it for many people determines what toys they get to play with um how long their hair is what they're allowed to like or dislike because we have to remember that children are experts in uh body language um and they will always choose the path that gets the most approval from their parents or caregivers because obviously it's in their interests to be um you know looked after and, and nurtured so you know the little boy who reaches for the barbie doll sees the disapproving you know look from his uh caregiver and is like oh that's not what i should be playing with goes towards the car receives the kind of you know non-verbal and we don't even know that we're doing it affirmation that that's an appropriate toy hopefully did this with my son because when he was at nursery he was determined to dress up in the princess dresses and I can picture in my head straight away my husband's reaction when the nursery staff told him that and then sometimes he would turn his um, toy car upside down to tinker with it my husband's a mechanic and he will have seen our reaction oh just like dad yeah Exactly. And, and, and we did, and studies have shown that people do this, you know, there, there was a, a study with um, parents who identified as being, you know, very open minded and liberal, etc. And they were, they uh, were with a group of babies who were, who were dressed as boys. And they were very, uh, they were quite hands off. They were encouraging them to move physically to engage with uh, technical toys uh, cars etc then uh, when they were interacting with a group who were dressed as girls they were more nurturing they were more um, the girls were encouraged to be more passive so they were holding them and they were introducing things to really? them so it was very much kind of you know that the the girls environment was controlled that the girls were not encouraged to be kind of you know grasping for things whereas that was seen as desirable in the boys so you know this concept of gender you know the box that we get put in uh from birth very much um you know determines kind of the the, mm. the paths we go down and um as someone who has always kind of resisted it and 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 uh, not been comfortable with it, it's it's a challenging journey because I've never uh, I've never been passive. Uh, I've never been uh, someone who is willing to allow you know others to to decide what can or can't you know what I'm going to be introduced to um and uh, so then I was labeled a tomboy you know as, as a teenager but that I, I didn't like that because I wasn't a boy you know and 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 I I didn't want to be uh labeled a boy and then and then you get the kind of tension between I don't feel like a, a girl in you know I don't like pink and pretty and all of that kind of stuff but I'm trying to conform to that because that's what everybody tells me that I need to do um but I'm not a boy either and I don't want to be labeled a boy because obviously masculine girls are you know wrong uh and it's just this whole kind of like confusion in in my head um and it's it's been it, it's been a, a life journey basically because also when you're younger you don't have the language to articulate what's happening to understand uh you know these are the pressures that I'm feeling that I'm kind of railing against uh and it's only re been really in the last kind of five years or so when I've um you know done more kind of reading on uh you know, gender and ideas of gender and and the uh, non-binary gender identity, you know, becoming more uh, 
um open and you know like more uh visible um and that I realized well actually that label actually probably is more accurate Mm. for me but it's taken me a long time to get here especially to a place where I'm willing to talk about it yeah um and people who I don't know will see the video which I find quite scary yeah and how did that journey um sort of pan out in terms of your faith well um I was raised a Catholic I went to a Catholic convent girls school um and so I've always you know known about God and 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 Jesus and my experience of uh going to a Catholic convent school was very positive uh the nuns in uh my school in my experience were very um accepting and open and understanding um and we did a lot of you know kind of spiritual retreats where we you know were looking you know the focus was on kind of love and and community um and uh but you know it was it was in the 90s so homosexuality was you know wrong but you know kind of all sex was wrong so uh it it kind of wasn't special (laughs) um but um when yeah so um what I got from that was that God is about love and and you know talking to everybody um and then um unfortunately uh my experience of um the church uh post school was more down the kind of more conservative evangelical uh, uh persuasion um I worked in Northern Ireland for a period of time with with different uh, Christian uh, groups and it was definitely more condemnatory and more about conforming with a particular idea of what I should be mm-hmm. as somebody that people perceived as a woman um, and uh you know what I should and shouldn't desire for for my life um that I needed to be more you know and I was a- actually told that I needed to be more you know submissive um and and less uh, opinionated um which uh did, didn't go down very well which, which never really gets said to men funnily enough well, of course it doesn't, because men are supposed to have all the opinions and uh, everything. Um, but, you know, and again, that hurts men too, because what if you don't have a, an opinion? What if you don't want to be a leader, you know, and, and the rest of it? So, you know, it, it it's in nobody's interests for these stereotypes to be maintained, really, apart from those people who are in control, I suppose. Well, on Wednesdays, we smash the patriarchy, as I saw on a fantastic Facebook post. Um, So in terms of the church, I think um, obviously there's a there's a really difficult sort of theological question about um, what the Bible tells us about some things. And, And, you know, if we're really honest with ourselves, I think there are things that the Bible simply didn't tackle because um it was written in a in a time and a context but if you were trying to i guess in your faith journey you must have wrestled with this to some extent um is there anything that you want to share with us about that journey yeah i mean for me what because when when i was um you know heavily involved in in the the kind of christian evangelical groups um my mental health was really poor uh because um I felt you know just wrong like everything about me was wrong and you know not not only uh you know my sexuality uh my gender my political views you know the fact that I have views the fact that I want to speak about you know so it it was it was really really a difficult uh 
difficult time and extremely challenging. Um, but I think because I grew up with such a strong concept of God being love and gentle, mm-hmm. um, that I was able to kind of come back to that and, and hold on to that. Mm-hmm. That actually, you know, God does love me yeah. and does accept me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not wrong, you know, any more than anybody else is, you know, mm-hmm. wrong. Yes. I don't, you yeah. know, it's not, it's not a useful like concept and 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 also like being a parent uh you know I'm I'm I have two children and and just loving them and and even when they you know I kind of think oh you know that's not great behavior and and I like talk to them about it and stuff and you know but I just love them and there's there's you know it's not I love you but you know or I love you despite the fact that blah 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 it you know I just I just love them and and so obviously you know that's how you know we're encouraged to think of God Mm -hmm. as you know like a parent and Mm -hmm. I think well if I'm capable of of unconditionally loving these two humans then of course you know God is able to love me just as I am and and um but my my faith is very um individual Mm -hmm. um because I haven't found a place where I feel safe and comfortable to um, worship, unfortunately. I don't have um, like a, 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 a community that, that I can feel mm-hmm. uh, part of. And actually, um, so we, my wife and I got married recently and we contacted our local uh, church and unfortunately, um, got quite I you know I know that they think that they were coming at it from the right point of view but it was very patronizing and very you know kind of oh you know of course we accept your lifestyle you know even though it's inherently sinful like you know it it, it was just really uncomfortable and when I kind of pushed back on it and tried to challenge them on it they got extremely hostile and um surprisingly aggressive actually so they they really were not open to kind of so sorry yeah congratulations oh thank you yeah Yeah, we we it was delayed due to covid but we got there in the end oh crikey that's awful we we're in the methodist church we're currently having conversations about same-sex marriage and i I sincerely hope that we will be able to do them relatively soon um you brought me on to something which i think i've got um, brain fog, but I think I forgot to talk in our terminology section about sexuality and gender, um, which might be a good thing to clarify now. Um, we we should be really clear to, to everyone watching that sexuality and gender are two separate things. So yeah. you have experience of um, of both in a in a challenging way, but um, do you want to just clarify for everybody that that they are not linked? Yeah, no, they're not linked at all. Um, So um, obviously, you know, a person um, can have whatever sexuality uh, they have and and there are a whole host of uh, sexual identities um, that, you know, and, and, and people, you know, trying to find words that best describe their experiences. And, you know, if you think about it, sex is extremely complicated. Um... Uh, especially in the modern world and 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 people kind of trying to navigate kind of old you know cultural historical ideas about sex and and everything um so yes you know a person's sexuality is is whoever it is that they're sexually attracted to if they are sexually attracted to anybody because obviously not everybody is asexual Mm -hmm. is a legitimate you know sexual identity some people have no sexual attraction or I mean asexual is again an umbrella term um that doesn't mean somebody has nothing just to clarify that but you know the point is it's it's not at all the same you can have gay uh you know trans men 
um, lesbian, trans women, you know, just the same as you have gay and lesbian, you know, cis mm. uh, men and women. And obviously non-binary people will have whatever sexuality mm. they have. Mm. It, it's just it's, not. It's, it's unfortunate that we somehow we conflate the terms. And I think maybe that's part of the um, the LGBT grouping which is um not not to say that that's a, a bad thing but um perhaps as church what we should be thinking is these are all people who are in some way not conforming to what society has thought of as the norm and we just need to get over that and yeah and and i mean there there has been kind of resistance within the um lgb community saying why why do we have the t ah. Uh, you know because it's not about sexuality Mm -hmm. Um, but it is that thing of you know it's people who who are different to the het norm you know we're not our society assumes that everybody is cisgender and everybody is heterosexual and you have to kind of make a big deal out of it if you're not and actually ideally everybody would just be able to be who whoever it is that they are and not have to you know come out and like we we said to our kids you know we we really you don't need to kind of assign a label to yourself unless you feel comfortable with it but you certainly don't have to kind of sit sit us down and say you know I'm I'm whatever you know sexuality I am or I'm whatever gender I am you know just yeah it doesn't you really, are you yeah yeah it really that, doesn't matter that seems like a really good place to stop really just because that is the underlying message that I'm hoping everyone is going to hear from this um Sunday social which is just that God loves us yeah. as we are and and as his church I personally believe that that we are all called to do the same and as my t-shirt says we leave the judge into Jesus well, I think that's that's the thing, like as because you asked me earlier, you know, what the church can do to help. And I, I think it is just that thing of of just accepting people and, you know, and also um, being aware that you don't know what's going on inside somebody. So you might be assuming that you're talking to a cisgender heterosexual person because they've not told you anything different, but you don't know what what internal journey they're having and things that you know we can say because we think we're talking to a particular kind of person it's like but you don't know what 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 impact that may or or may not be having on them you know and and I think as Christians you know we're supposed to represent Jesus and you know Jesus wasn't going around you know labeling people and saying you know this that and the other to them he he was sitting down having real conversations you know breaking bread with them um and not requiring them to you know reject you know important aspects of their identity before he would you know tolerate them no absolutely not brilliant thank you so much Jordan you're welcome I wonder if any of you have read The Shack. <clears throat> I don't know if that's reversed on your screen, but it's, it's a book called The Shack by William Paul Young. <clears throat> the book's been recommended to me by a few people and I've only just got round to reading it. It's a great book, albeit quite challenging. So if you're up for an emotional journey of discovery, do look it up. I want to start by sharing an extract with you that talks about our perception of the gender of God. Before this passage, Mac, who is the main character, who has experienced extreme trauma, has been invited to a shack to spend the weekend with God and finds three characters there waiting for him. Papa, an African-American woman, an Asian woman called Sarayu, and Jesus, a Middle Eastern man. <clears throat> Shaq 
She picked up the wooden spoon again, dripping with some sort of batter. Mackenzie, I am neither male nor female, even though both genders are derived from my nature. If I choose to appear to you as a man or a woman, it's because I love you. For me to appear to you as a woman and suggest that you call me Papa is simply to mix metaphors, to help you keep from falling so easily back into your religious conditioning. She leaned forward as if to share a secret. To reveal myself to you as a very large, white grandfather figure with a flowing beard like Gandalf would simply reinforce your religious stereotypes. And this weekend is not about reinforcing your religious stereotypes. Mac almost laughed out loud and wanted to say, you think? I'm over here barely believing that I'm not stark raving mad. Instead, he focused on what she had just said and regained his composure. He believed, in his head at least, that God was a spirit, neither male nor female. But in spite of that, he was embarrassed to admit to himself that all his visuals for God were very white and very male. It's interesting, isn't it, how much we give a male gender to God. So in preparing for this service, I also recently read a book called Beyond a Binary God by Tara Sowers. It's really interesting and quite challenging. It talks about gender in the context of transgender, but also about how gender is portrayed in the Bible and how gender appears in nature. Nature can tell us a bit about gender and what that might mean to God. So I'm reading from Beyond a Binary God. Although it may sound odd to those of us used to thinking in binary terms, a close look at God's creation shows that gender identity and gender expression are complex among all of God's creatures. While we may assume that the primary care of young is always associated with females, that is not the case with the spotted sandpiper. After mating and laying eggs, the female sandpiper flies off to find another mate, leaving the eggs in the care of the male. Not only does the male incubate the eggs, but he stays with the young birds for at least four weeks after they hatch. While we assume that gender is stable, that is not the case with the hawkfish. All hawkfish are born female, but if there are not enough males in a harem, then one or more of the females in the harem will become male and the harem will split. If a male hawkfish loses part of his harem and then is challenged by a larger male, rather than fighting, as is the case with many animal species, the smaller male will revert back to being a female. While we assume that giving birth is associated with females, in seahorses, it's the male that gives birth. There is great variety and complexity throughout God's creation, not only with human beings, but also with the animal population, indicating, just maybe, that God does not always think the same way that we do about gender. It really struck home to me when Auden was talking, and, and Ella as well, about the gender stereotypes that we have constructed in the society around us, even when we don't realise we're doing it. So I don't want to baffle you with uh, complex biblical interpretation. As Ella mentioned in our chat, it's quite easy for a church leader or church community to say that they have the right interpretation of any biblical passage. But I guess in the interests of challenging inherited wisdom, I do want to do a little bit of Bible study here. So in Genesis, we have two creation stories. There's a creation story in Genesis 1 and another one in Genesis 2. Now this poses some biblical authority challenges. We have two stories, which if both held to be literally true, as some people do consider the Bible to be, then they actually contradict each other. 
How does that work? I'm not going to answer that question. That's for another sermon. The second creation story uses a Hebrew word for the first human being, which is not gendered, an earth creature. Our Bibles use the word man, but the original text doesn't denote a gendered being. The earth creature was alone, one of its kind. When another is created, gender appears in this story and the two beings are different gender. Now what we could interpret from this is that gender is not an absolutely fundamental characteristic of the creation of humans. It's not part of being formed in the image of God because God is not gendered. Arguably, the first human being, if they were to form both a man and a woman, would have been intersex. I did say it was going to be challenging, but now let me add something else. If the Bible only defines two genders, and that means we can't recognise anything else, what about twilight and dawn? The Bible only refers to day and night, but that doesn't mean that twilight doesn't exist. We impose binaries on our lives and the lives of others where the Bible is not quite so straightforward. But let's not get ourselves tied in knots about this. It's fair to say that we don't find any easy answers to the idea of transgender in the Bible, in the same way that many of us don't find easy answers to the question of homosexuality. What I want to say is that I believe in contextual theology. That is, that our context, our experiences and the world around us have a valid role in helping us understand God. I think it's also fair to say that we probably all believe humankind was created in the image of God, but that the image of God is not a gender, ethnicity, age, <clears throat> age or sexuality profile. If we're going to be really faithful to the gospel, the good news, then we need to recognise that churches have caused a great deal of hurt amongst those who do not conform to what we've traditionally defined as normal, and that's not acceptable. Those of us without personal experience of this will not be able to understand it, not really. It's not something that you can imagine if you do not feel it yourself. But that doesn't mean that we can't show empathy and grace. If we think that ours is the only right way to interpret the Bible and the image of God, and are not open to different views and conversations, then we are elevating ourselves to a level of superiority over others that I find very uncomfortable. LGBT people should not be the casualties of a faith that can't stop itself judging. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We'll leave the judging to Jesus. Not because we're defining these things as sins. I mean by this, we leave the judging to Jesus, that it's in Jesus's hands, in God's hands. I had a weird moment the other day when I was driving home from taking a funeral and I found myself thinking, hmm, I'm actually quite comfortable in my own skin. I am enough. I've spent many years doubting my own worth and I realised that I'm finally grateful to God for making me, me, with all my flaws and my issues. I mention that here because we need to show that we are grateful for all our siblings in Christ. No conditions, no need to conform, just as they are. Those people who haven't been or maybe can't yet be truly happy with who they are might just need us to show them that we already love them. If you've made it this far, well done. As they say, Jesus came to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. So let's keep the courage to be a bit disturbed 
and remember that our comfort is in the God who loves us unconditionally. Peace be with you. Do you?